There you go. There's an argument in predicate logic. And you already know how to prove this. How many lines will I need? Just one. So if it's just one, obviously that will have the conclusion on it. How do I get? What's my justification? How did I get the conclusion? Modus ponens. One comma two. There you go. There's a proof in predicate logic. It's a proof, and it involves predicates. So it must be a proof in predicate logic. But notice we didn't need to. We just used rules we already knew. And a lot, uh, a big part of, uh, of proof in predicate logic will be just doing stuff we already know how to do. However, let's consider an argument we know, we've already talked about, that we know is valid. All frogs are green. Kermit is a frog. Conclusion, Kermit is green. Let's symbolize that. How do we do all frogs are green? What's that? For everything in the universe, if it's a frog, then it is green. So that's all frogs are green. How do we symbolize Kermit is a frog? F, K. And then how do we symbolize Kermit is green? G, K. All right. Now, clearly, modus ponens is going to be involved, right? Because we have, a, it looks pretty much like this. We have a conditional, we have something that looks like the antecedent, and we have something that looks like the consequent. And you will have to use modus ponens. But you can't just do modus ponens. Why not? Yes, for one thing, this is fx, and this is fk. So you do not have the antecedent of this. For another thing, this is a conditional. Right? This is a conditional, which is why you can do modus ponens with it. The main connective is the conditional. What's the main connective of this line? The quantifier. The quantifier. The quantifier is the main connective. But remember, the main connective is the thing you do last, the thing that's outside of all parentheses. We're not used to thinking of quantifiers as connectives, but they do work like that. So. If we were going to do modus ponens, we have to get rid of that quantifier. And that's what uh, two of the rules that you're going to be learning will do. So, that, the reason why we need extra rules for predicate logic is to deal with quantifiers. Either to get rid of quantifiers, or to get quantifiers back at the end. And in fact, there are four inference forms that you will need to learn uh, for predicate logic. So how many inference forms were there before? Nine. So uh, when you're done with predicate logic, you will know 13 inference forms. How many equivalence forms do you know? Well, how many equivalence forms are there? 10, yes. And of course, you know them all. You've memorized them. Uh, you only need one more equivalence form for predicate logic, and I've already mentioned it. Quantifier negation. Um, remember, we were talking, this came up when we were talking about there is no evil. There are two ways of saying there is no evil. You can either say everything in the universe is not evil, or you can say it is not the case that there exists an evil thing. And those two are equivalent. If they're equivalent, there must be a rule of equivalence that says that. And there is. They're equivalent by quantifier negation. QN for short. Or, as I like to call it, magic hopping tilde. Okay? Quantifier negation is the magic hopping tilde. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because, first of all, when you do quantifier negation, it involves a tilde hopping. Hopping where? Over a quantifier. That's the only, first of all, only one quantifier, and that's the only thing it hops over. Nothing else changes. 
Uh, well, except one thing. <laughs> um, because I haven't mentioned why it's a magic hopping tilde. Obviously, well, you know, there's some magic if it can hop, but still, that's not all there is. So the two things happen when you do quantifier negation. First of all, the tilde hops over the quantifier. And notice, because uh, rules of equivalence work both ways, this is equivalent to this, this is equivalent to this, so you can convert from one into the other by quantifier negation. It doesn't matter which way you go. It doesn't matter which way the, the tilde hops. It can hop this way or it can hop this way. But it's magic. So as it hops over the quantifier, it sprinkles magic pixie dust on the quantifier. And what happens? Changes it from universal or particular to the other? Yes. It changes the quantifier from the quantifier it is to the other type of quantifier. So, uh, in this case, the tilde is to the right of the quantifier, so the only way it can hop is to the left and it turns it into the existential. Or you can start here, it hops over it, and it turns it into a universal. That's what quantifier negation does. Now, remember the square of opposition. A, E, I, and O. Remember that there were all these logical relationships amongst them. Do you remember that? Can you remember what this was called? Contrary. Good, but you don't have to remember that. Because that only applied in classical logic. There was only one relationship that worked in both classical and modern logic. And predicate logic is modern logic. So that's the only relationship that we need to care about. What was that? Contradictory. Contradictory. And where did they go? Uh, diagonal. diagonal. So A is contradictory to O, and I is contradictory to E. That means uh, that, for example, this is the contradictory of this. Right? What does contradictory mean? They can't be true at the same time. Which means that if this is true, this is false. false. And if this is false, this is true. true. So they have opposing truth values. What that tells me, what else has exactly opposite truth values to this? answer this to the tilde in front of it, right? That's obviously going to have the opposite truth values. This is going to have the opposite truth values to this, which means what? It means that this is equivalent to this, right? Because this is true when this is false, and so is this. It's a good thing you can see on the board, because otherwise that would be a lot of this is. Now, if those two are equivalent in the same way that I just said these two are equivalent, you must be able to convert from that into that by rules of equivalence. And you can. Let's prove it. So we're going to start with that, and we're going to end up with this. by rules of equivalence. Guess what the first one we're going to use is? What's that? No. Good guess, but the first one we're going to use is? Quantifier negation. What's that going to give me, Josh? Um, existential. Um, quantifier, not modifier. <laughs> and notice, Nothing else changes, so the entire rest of the line is going to be the same. The only thing that changes is the position of the tilde and the quantifier. Don't mess with anything else in the line. Quantifier negation is simple. Don't overcomplicate it. All right, but notice that is not the same as that. Well, but wait a minute. You can convert from that into that by doing, Zach? Implication. Remember, implication, there's three things you do if you want to convert between a conditional and a conjunction. First, replace the conditional with the conjunction. Second, negate the one on the right. Third, negate everything. So this becomes not, not. This would become not, not that. And then, you know, double negation. So actually, let's do that. Let's include the double negation. There you go. So we proved that they're equivalent. 
it is not the case that all S of P is equivalent to some S and not P. Obviously, because if it's not true that all S are P, the reason it's not true that all S are P is that some S are not P. First of all, can you do quantifying negation with something that looks like that? Yes, you can. Because quantifying negation is a rule of equivalence. And if you remember, rules of equivalence, you can do them to just parts of lines. It doesn't matter um, where the relevant connective is that you're going to do the rule on. It doesn't matter if it's the main connective of the whole line or if it's just tucked away in a <coughs> tiny corner of a giant line. You can do the rule of equivalence, provided you leave the rest of the line alone. That's the thing about rules of equivalence. You can do them to parts of lines. So, quantify negation. <coughs> Remember, it's magic hopping tilde. It's magic because, well, it's hopping because the tilde hops. The tilde is a weak tilde, though. It's like the pawn of the tilde world, in that it can only hop over one quantifier as a t at a time. You cannot hop over more than one. If you do, you're doing it wrong. That is illegitimate. However, like pawn, no, not like pawns, it's more like a king. There you go. It can hop in either direction. So, quantify negation. If I did quantify negation of this, it could give me this. Uh, that should be there shouldn't be a gap there. I've just spaced it wrong. The tilde should be right next to the other. But you see what's happened. The tilde has hopped over the existential quantifier. And because it's a magic hopping tilde, it has changed the quantifier it hops over. It sprinkles magic pixie dust. So, all that happens is the position of the, of the tilde changes and the quantifier that it has hopped over changes type from an existential to a universal. Alternatively, it could hop the other way. That's equally allowed. So, then, if it does that, what do I do next? What's this? Existential Y, because it was universal, but it's been hopped, and then this one remains existential because it hasn't been hopped over. There you go. That's quantifying negation. Don't overcomplicate it. All that happens is the position of the tilde changes from one side to another <coughs> quantifier, and that quantifier changes type. Everything else in the line remains unchanged. Okay? All right. Now we're going to learn the four new inference forms. Now, let's remind ourselves of what is distinctive about inference forms. Let's talk about simplification, because that's the simplest of the inference forms. Can I do simplification to that? Yes. What would it give me? P, or alternatively, Q. Can I do simplification to that? No. No, I cannot. So that's what's uh, different between rules of equivalence and inference forms. Inference forms, you can only do them uh, if the entire line has the relevant connective, if the main connective is right. So with simplification, the main connective has to be conjunction. Here, the main connective is the tilde, the negation. So you cannot do simplification to that line. All right. The same uh, restriction applies to <coughs> our four new rules. What we're going to introduce now is the four new inference forms. So if you remember, there are nine inference forms in non-predicate logic and also in predicate logic, because predicate logic has everything that non-predicate logic has plus predicates. So you already know nine inference forms, modus ponens, modus tollens, simplification, addition, all those guys. Okay, well now you're going to learn four more. Uh, why do you need four more for um, predicate logic? The answer is because of the predicate. No, because of the quantifiers, actually, not because of the predicates. The predicates don't really make any difference. If you didn't have any quantifiers, in fact, if you have some predicate logic that doesn't have quantifiers in it, just predicates and names, then you don't need any of the new rules. You don't need quantify negation because there's no quantifiers, and you don't need any of the four rules that you're about to learn. 
so it's only to deal with quantifiers. That's the only reason you need um, these four rules. And in fact, uh, in an argument that we were that you know I've used as an example many times, um, that kind of shows why we need uh, quantifier negation, and that is uh, all frogs are green. Kermit is a frog, therefore Kermit is green, which looks like this. Okay, all. All frogs are green, that's an A-type, so, you know, universal quantifier of conditional. Uh, Kermit is green, is a frog, conclusion, Kermit is green. Now, as we were saying last time, we can't just do modus ponens here, because that quantifier is the main connective. You could do modus ponens if that quantifier wasn't there, and if, uh, if this was not an X, it was a K. But this is an X, and this is a K. So you, there's two reasons you can't do modus ponens. So what you need to do is you need something that will get rid of this quantifier so that what's left is a conditional and that will change the x's into k's. What that thing is, as we'll see first, is something called universal instantiation. But let's take a step back. Here are, um, let's see, here are, here are the four new rules. They are universal or existential instantiation or generalization. So combine them, you have UI, which is un universal instantiation. You have UG, which is universal generalization. You have EI, which is existential instantiation. And you have EG, which is existential generalization. All right, what the hell do these things mean? Well, you understand the universal and the existential. Universal means involving universal quantifiers. Existential means involving existential quantifiers. Those are the two types of quantifiers. So you know what those mean. What's instantiation and generalization? Well, they are respectively. Instantiation means getting rid of quantifiers, and generalization means adding quantifiers. Why are they called that? Well, generalization makes sense, because if you add a quantifier, you're going from the more specific, which involves names, remember names refer to specific definite things, to more general. You're making a more general claim. And this is obvious in particular if you're talking about a universal quantifier. So you would be going from Kermit is a frog to everything is a frog, if you were to do universal generalization, which in fact you can't do in that instance. But if you could, that would be universal generalization. All right. So, uh, let's summarize the rules of instantiation, first of all. There are two rules that apply to both kinds of instantiation, universal and existential. Turns out, uh, for universal instantiation, there are only these two rules. But existential instantiation has an extra rule as well, as we'll see. Okay, instantiation. What do you do? Well, First of all, you remove the quantifier. Now remember, this is an inference form. So as with all inference forms, it applies to the entire line. So you can only do, and this is very important, this applies to your homework. You can only do instantiation if the main connective of the entire line is a quantifier. If, on the other hand, you have uh, something like this, where, say, if Kermit is a frog, then something is a frog. So that says, if Kermit is a frog, then something is a frog. You cannot do instantiation to that, because the main connective on that line is the conditional. You can't do instantiation there. You can only do instantiation to something like this, something is a green frog, because then that is the main quantifier. And then, of course, because that's an existential quantifier, you'd be doing existential instantiation. So remember that. That's very important. Um, so you remove the main quantifier, and, and this is the note, must be the main connective of the entire line. If the main connective of the entire line is not a quantifier, you cannot do instantiation to that line. Can't be done. 
Um, like with simplification. Simplification is another rule of uh, another inference form. And you, if a line has a conjunction in it, but it's in parentheses and it's not the main connective, then you can't do simplification. OK, it's only if the conjunction is the, the main connective of the entire line. All right, so remove the main, con uh, main quantifier, provided there is one. Then replace all the variables that the quantifier bound. So let's say it was an x quantifier. Then you look for all the x's in the line, and you replace them with the same name. So you replace all the x's with whatever name you want. Now, uh, if it's universal instantiation that you're doing, you can pick any name you want. You just have to use the same name for every x. So you can go A, 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 B, 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 C, 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 whatever. Because for universal instantiation, you're going from a universal claim. You're going from something that says everything in the universe is this. So if everything in the universe is this, then you can pick any name you want. Um, that's important. However, with existential instantiation, you can't do that. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But those are the two rules that apply to uh, both kinds of instantiation. All right, let's look at universal instantiation as an example. Now, remember, we only need these rules because we're going to do proofs. So let's look at a proof. And it's the argument we were just talking about. All frogs are green. Kermit is a frog. It's, I shouldn't have picked Kermit, really, because this little k, this is fk, and it looks like the fx, but they're different. Up here is an x, down here is a k, and of course this is a k as well. So if all frogs are green, uh, we symbolize this for everything in the universe. If it's a frog, then it's green. That's an a type. Kermit is a frog. Conclusion, Kermit is green. Now, as we just said, we can't just do modus ponens because of this quantifier right here. What we need to do is get rid of this quantifier and change this x to a k. Well, turns out that's what universal instantiation does. So as you see on line three, I do universal instantiation. I follow the two rules. I remove, first rule is you remove this quantifier. So I've done that. And then you replace all the x's with the same name. Now I could pick any name I want. But of course, what I want to use is a k, because I already have a k here, and I want to be able to do modus ponens and end up with gk. So that's why I picked the name k here. But I could use any name. All right. And then finally, then I can do modus ponens and end up with the conclusion. So that's it to universal instantiation. There are only the two rules of instantiation that we've already introduced. But remember, it is an inference form, so you can only do it to an entire line, unlike quantifier negation, which is an equivalence form. All right. Um, now, of these four, universal instantiation is probably the simplest. That's why we, we started with it. It makes the most sense. If you say, so if you start with everything in the universe is green, then clearly it follows validly that Kermit is green or anything you like. You know, this cup is green. It's not, but you know, if everything in the universe was green, then it would follow validly that this cup is green. So universal instantiation makes sense as a valid inference form. Uh, which, of course, it is. That's what all the inference forms are, little valid arguments. All right. Now, let's. the next simplest is existential generalization. And with existential generalization, basically, uh, well, let's look at generalization in general. Here are the two rules of generalization. Remember, instantiation is called instantiation because you're moving from a general claim to a specific instance of that claim. You know, you know when we use the phrase, for instance, what we mean is, uh, I've just given you a general rule, and now I'm going to give you an example. That's what instantiation is. You move from something general that has quantifiers in it to a specific instance. You move from everything in the universe is green to Kermit is green. So that's why that's called instantiation. Generalization, of course, is moving in the opposite direction. You start from something definite and individual, like a name, and you move to something more general, like a variable. All right, so there are two rules that apply to both the generalizations. First, now you're adding a quantifier. And remember, because it's an inference form, you have it has to apply to the entire line. So you add quantifier to the extreme left, and it applies to the entire line. There can't be anything to the left of it, and the scope of it has to be the entire line. 
Uh, and then uh, now that you've added a quantifier, you have to have something to, for it to apply to. If there's more than one name, then you can pick what name you want. So, for example, let's pick existential generalization. Suppose um, you have something like this. Romeo loves Juliet. That's a capital L, little r, j. Now, suppose I wanted to do existential generalization to that. I could do either this, which says something loves Juliet, or I could equally well do this, which says Romeo loves something. In other words, it doesn't matter which name I pick to generalize from. I can pick whichever one. What I cannot do is I cannot do this. I cannot replace two different names with the same variable. I can only re uh, pick one of the names to replace with the variable. So the first two are OK, but the last one is not allowed. OK, so generalization, just to recap. You add a quantifier to the extreme left, and it implies to the entire line, and you replace all instances of one name with variable bound by the new quantifier. OK, let's see it in action. So let's uh, adapt my favorite arguments about Kermit. And now it says, all frogs are green. Kermit is a frog. Conclusion, something is green. Now. That's valid, right? Because obviously we know that if Kermit is green, if Kermit is a frog, then Kermit is green. And if Kermit is green, then something is green. Existential generalization is obviously valid. If you go from Kermit is green to something is green, if Kermit is green, then it obviously follows validly that something is green. You're just being less specific. So it's clearly a, a valid argument. All right, so let's see how this argument would go. You would say, just like before, you would universally instantiate and I would pick Kermit, and then you would do modus ponens again, and then finally I would use my existential generalization to move from Kermit is green to something is green. And again, with existential generalization, there are only the two rules of generalization that I've already introduced. Okay, so the out of the four, the easy ones are universal instantiation and existential generalization. They don't have any extra rules. They're all just two rule uh, things. That's my fun. Um, so the easy two are universal instantiation and existential generalization. Now, let's move on to existential instantiation. And we'll have a good story to tell about that in class. So that's something to look forward to. I didn't include this little story in the online video because I don't want it getting out, OK? Uh, because uh, actually, unbeknownst to the university, I have a second job. Not only do I work as a, a, a professor at the University of Michigan, I'm a consulting detective to the Flint police. It's true. They only call me in for the really tough crimes because I use logic. I use logic to solve them. And uh, it turns out, like a couple of weeks ago, there was a particularly nasty murder. Uh, a guy called Joe was brutally killed in his apartment, stabbed 300 times. So, yeah, I know. Horrible. So uh, they called me in, like they do for the really tough crimes, and you know I come in and I see Joe lying in a pool of blood on the floor, stabbed 300 times, and I say, "Whew! Wait a minute!" I pull out my portable chalkboard, which I take everywhere. That's one of my things. You know, I don't have a deer stalker; I have a portable chalkboard. So, and I wrote on it this: And I, I showed this, and the police were very impressed, until I explained what it means. What does it mean? Someone killed Joe. Someone killed Joe. They weren't so impressed when they found out that that's what it meant. In fact, I believe someone said, no shit, Sherlock. OK, you know, it's, it's not a suicide. He stabbed 300 times. But I said, you know, I have to do this. This is just the first step. You're going to be impressed by the next step, because I'm going to solve the crime. I'm going to solve the crime with a single step. And that single step is existential instantiation. Now, existential instantiation works like this. 
its instantiation, you remove the quantifier. And of course, it's an existential one. And then what do you do? You replace all variables with the same name, and the name is, in fact, Don. So I'm sorry, Don, they're coming to get you. I told the police, I've solved the crime, and you're it. Had to be someone, Don. Now, what are you going to say in your defense when they, they, I tell them to wait till the end of the class and not make a scene, so. What are you going to say in your defense when they come for you? Other than looking for actual evidence, physical evidence? For but look, I, I solved it using logic. That's, that's instantiation. This, if that was universal instantiation, that would be perfectly okay. I removed the quantifier, it was the main quantifier. I replaced all instances of the same variable with the same name. It just so happened to be your name. Those are the breaks, you know. Don't try and deny it. Just because it was someone, it just doesn't mean that it was me. Right. This is the difference between existential and universal instantiation. If it's universal, that would have been okay. If it's true of everything of the universe, you know, obviously Joe was a very hated person. There's actually a, um, an Agatha Christie story called uh, <coughs> Murder on the Orient Express. Uh, and um, it turns out that a person is found stabbed 12 times and it turns out it's all 12 passengers because everybody hated this guy. Sorry for, if that's a spoiler alert for you. But, um, but yeah, you know, if it was true that everyone in the universe killed Joe, then obviously it would be true to say that you killed Joe because everybody did. But the difference is if you say someone killed, or, or something killed Joe, I can't just pick who I want. Why not? Not that I want to say because this. Because it might not be true of them. There's no way. To right. Do because just because it's true of something doesn't mean that it's true of everything. Doesn't mean that it's true of the particular name you want. But we have to be able to use existential instantiation. Uh, so there must be we must we must be able to do it. It's just it must have more restrictions than just these two. If I just follow these two rules, then I've solved the crime by picking any name I want. But I can't do that. So there has to be another restriction. And the other restriction on existential instantiation is rule three. I must introduce a new name. A name that hasn't occurred. Now, it turns out, you know, in this case, um, the name done hasn't, hasn't occurred previously. But uh, to, to give an analogy in everyday life, here's what I would have to do. I would have to use... Uh, his would be a legitimate instance of existential instantiation. If I said, okay, I'm going to tell you who killed Joe. It's the stabicizer. I know him by his handiwork, right? He stabs 300 times. Why is it okay to say the stabicizer killed Joe, but it's not okay to say Don killed Joe? Because you just named that random someone by that by the name of Stabicizer. In other words, I'm introducing the name to refer to whoever it is. Kill Joe. Think of the name Jack the Ripper. Who's heard the name Jack the Ripper? Who's Jack the Ripper? Mm. Yes, in, uh, it's a famous serial a killer from, from Victorian England. The fact is we use the name Jack the Ripper without actually knowing who it is. But the ne it's still a name that functions like a name because it picks out whoever it was killed those victims in Victorian London. So, think of the name introduced by existential instantiation like that. You've got to introduce a new <coughs> name. You can't use a name that's come before. What's weird about existential instantiation is um, it seems like there must be restrictions on it. Because what it's doing, of course, is it's going from something is, let's say, green or whatever predicate you're talking about, to a specific name. Uh, but there's obviously got to be um, some restrictions on that, because suppose I would, were to say something is red. That's obviously true. And then I were to say uh, this cup is red. Now, that would be an instance of uh, existential instantiation, because I've replaced a variable by something with a name. The name refers to this cup. Notice how many cups I have. But while it's true that something is red, just to prove it, there, this proves that something is red. It is false that this cup is red. So obviously I can't just replace the variable 
with any name I want. That's why there has to be an extra rule. There's an extra restriction on um, existential instantiation. This is rule three, uh, the, you know, rule, uh, the, the first two rules are the rules of instantiation that I've already given you. Rule three is existential instantiation must introduce a new name that hasn't occurred before. So notice what happens if I try to prove this argument, which is it's another variant of the ones I've been using. Um, all frogs are green. Something is a frog. Therefore, something is green. That is a valid argument. But look what happens um, if I start, as I have done before, by doing uh, by introducing a name. Incidentally, now I'm not talking about Kermit, so I can just use a sort of dummy name. I can introduce any name. So that it's traditional just to use A. Who or what is A? It doesn't matter. It's just a name, kind of a placeholder. All right. So all frogs are green. By universal instantiation, I say Al is a frog. If Al is a frog, then Al is green, just because Al begins with A. Now, what I obviously want to do is I want to introduce, uh, uh, I want to instantiate from here and then set up a modus ponens. But the trouble is, once I've introduced that name, I can't use existential instantiation to introduce A again because of this rule. Existential instantiation must introduce a new name. So if the name A has already been used, I can't use it. So I would have to say B, and then I can't do my proof. I can't do modus ponens. What this means is that existential instantiation requires strategy when you're doing a proof. There is a way to do this proof, but you just have to be a little sneaky. And the way is this. Instead of starting by doing universal instantiation, you start by doing the existential instantiation. Because if you do that first, then there's no name above it, and it's okay to use whatever name you want. And then you can do uh, the universal instantiation, and because there are no restrictions on universal instantiation, um, you can match the name. So then you can use the name that you've just introduced, and then you can do modus ponens, uh, and then you can do um, existential generalization, as we've uh, learned how to do just now. So put that all together, and it would look like this. So notice, whereas before I did universal instantiation on line three, now I'm going to do the existential instantiation on line three. And because the name A has not occurred anywhere above it, obviously it doesn't occur on lines one or two, I, it's perfectly OK to use it. And then using universal instantiation on line four, I can match A because there's no restrictions on what name you can use with universal instantiation. All right, so just remember, for universal existential instantiation, there is that extra extra rule. Universal instantiation doesn't have that rule. Only EI has that rule. Finally, we've done three out of four. The last one is universal generalization. Now, universal generalization is pretty weird if you think about it. Because if, if you can do universal generalization, then it looks like you could start with uh, Kermit is a frog, which is true. And then obviously universal generalization, because it's generalization, is you're going to add a quantifier. And because it's universal generalization, it would be the universal one. So you go from Kermit is a frog to everything in the universe is a frog. Now, it's obviously true that Kermit is a frog. Well, actually, he's a Muppet, but we'll pretend. Um, obviously, that's true. But everything is a frog is obviously false. So again, there must be some kinds of restrictions on what name you can do do it to. And the answer is, here's the rule. Uh, now, but you do need universal um, generalization. You have to be able to do it, because otherwise you couldn't prove a valid argument like this. This is our old friend. Um, all chihuahuas are dogs. All dogs are mammals. Therefore, all ch it's very difficult to do, move this backwards. Therefore, all chihuahuas are mammals. That's an AAA1 argument, if you remember that, um, what we did before the midterm. And we know that those are valid. So, but obviously, to do the first part, 
you have to um, introduce a name, and then you can do hypothetical syllogism. So you say, if A is, that is an A. No, actually, it's a U. Um, because the rule here is you can only, universal generalization can only generalize from the name U. This is my own rule. This is not in the book. Uh, I will explain this more in class, but basically this is my rule. You cannot do universal generalization from any name but the name U. The reason why you can do universal generalization from the name U here is because it's been introduced by universal instantiation. So the extra, uh, so there needs to be another rule here, which is you can only introduce the name U by either universal instantiation or assumption. Remember assumptions? Um, if you're doing a conditional proof or a reductio ad absurdum. So, you can only introduce the name U by universal instantiation or by assumption. Uh, either of those ways allows U to stand in for anything in the universe. U is kind of generic. It could be anything. And because U is generic, I'll say more about this in class, you can universally generalize from it. Kermit is not generic. Kermit is a specific individual. And what is true of Kermit isn't necessarily true of everything in the universe. But we know because we've already started from a general claim that this is true of anything in the universe. So you can sort of be a dummy for anything in the universe, which is why you can universally generalize from it. All right. I'm going to talk more about this in class, but uh, I thought this would be a good starter uh, in case you wanted to finish your homework. That should give you an idea of when something is legitimate and um, when it isn't. If it follows all of the rules, the two rules for universal instantiation and existential generalization, the three rules for existential instantiation and universal generalization, then it's okay. If it violates any of those rules, then it's not okay. All right.